Okay, you know you're not ripping off Boggle right when you end up with a grid that somehow has only 8 consonants and 17 vowels. Today's episode of Ancient DOS Games is going to be slightly different from the norm, since instead of reviewing a single game, we're going to be taking a look at a bunch of games made by a single company. Specifically, Solo Software, started by William Solo way back around the start of the 90s. Although it's difficult to pin down the exact point in time when he started the company, seeing as William Slow was writing software sometime beforehand. Although it is important to note that William Slow was not the only person writing games under the Slow Software banner, although he was the person doing most of the coding. There was a huge number of games to come out of Slow in the days of DOS. In fact, all of them are DOS software, even though Windows 3.1 was out at the time, and none of these games are so complicated that they couldn't have been made in Windows. In fact, once Windows 95 hit the scene, software from Slow took a notable dive in quantity as they switched from DOS development to Windows, and instead of releasing 4-6 to six games per year, they were now only releasing about one game every 2 or 3 years. Now, as one might expect just browsing through the list of slow titles out there, a lot of the games they offer are similar to other existing games, including their own. But each usually has slightly different rules or gameplay compared to the games they're based on. While every slow game is playable for sure, the level of difficulty is often high, and random chance can really factor into things. Not to mention some of their games are decent, while others are just rage-inducing. I'm only going to go over a few titles today, both good and bad, but I'll probably do another video like this one in the future to take a look at some more of their games. Also, we won't be going through the whole game stats and DOSBox configuration details, because a lot of them are virtually identical. Almost every game in the slow library runs in an EGA 640x350 16 color video mode, every game uses the PC speaker for sound effects exclusively, every game pretty much works with zero extra configuration under DOSBox, just leaving cycle set to auto, and all of these games are still available for download and purchase from the slow software website at www.slow.com since yes, they're actually still around, though their latest games were released about two and a half years ago. And one other last general thing to point out is that I'm only running the unregistered shareware copies of these games. The thing is, registration for these games typically just unlocks save game abilities, the ability to play multiplayer on the same computer with other people, and additional levels, not to mention it gets rid of the nag screens. Wordle is essentially a boggle clone. The idea here is that you have a grid of randomly generated letters, and you must make words by connecting letters together in any directions, though you can't use the same letter tile more than once in a word. Now, considering Boggle is a popular word game played with nothing more than letter-faced dice in a tray, an hourglass, a sheet of paper, and a pencil, one would imagine a computerized variant should be just as good. However, of all the games I'm taking a look at today, this is my least favorite for a very simple reason. It's not properly balanced. The actual game of Boggle is done with a 4x4 grid of 6-sided dice, 16 in total. However, instead of having numbers on them, each die has letters. Now, given that there's 26 letters in the alphabet, you can't fit all of those onto a single 6-sided die. However, to keep things from getting horribly unbalanced in terms of playing the game, each die has had its letters specially selected, so that a good balance of words is possible each time the dice are rolled. Wordle is simply attaching probabilities to each letter. The result is that many times you end up with grids that are incredibly difficult to make words out of. Furthermore, Wordle doesn't control very well either. If you make a mistake when entering a word, you can't erase your entry and try again until you have at least four letters selected. In fact, given how Boggle works, having to manually input the string of letters you want to make on the tile grid itself is surprisingly unfun. In real Boggle, you just write down the words you see. You don't have to draw out the exact pattern that it makes, since when playing with other people, they could just challenge your words all the same. 
Basically, it's a fairly poor Boggle clone, but at least it's playable. And given that this is the worst game of the ones that I picked for this week, it kind of goes to show that they're going to improve a good amount. Ant Run is essentially Pipe Dream with a twist. No, literally. All the pieces are already on the board, and you spin them to face the directions you want them to. And in Pipe Dream, you would get a random array of pipe pieces to fit onto a grid, and would have to fit them together as best as possible so liquid could flow through them for as long as possible. The rules here in Ant Run are a little more unusual, though, and can take a little to get used to. Firstly, there's a gauge at the side of the screen indicating the length the ant has traveled for once it enters the maze. Now, if an ant crosses one side of the board, it emerges on the opposite side. However, if the length travel is wrapped over the gauge, some of the board will be regenerated, thus making it potentially possible to keep the ant going indefinitely. I imagine part of the reason it was done this way was to get around some of the limitations of the level generator. Specifically, the game often creates paths and ways and places that are simply not possible to ever reach, or will spell doom for your ant if you attempt to go down them. This is made more damning once bonus paths show up, and especially once end tunnels show up, since if you don't guide the ant into an end tunnel, you'll get a game over no matter how many points you scored. Now just like with Pipe Dream, you can also double your score by engaging fast mode. Now because of the mechanic regenerating the board though, the fast mode will disengage if your ant crosses any side of the maze. In order to advance to the next level, you simply must earn the target score. Fail to reach the target score and the game is over. And that's all there really is to this one. It's frustratingly difficult to get anywhere with this game, but it controls well, so that's why I rank it above Wordle. Seen a pattern yet? I should know that the best slow games are the ones which are more original, which is partly why these first ones I'm looking at all have been clones of other games. Isle Wars is essentially the same as the strategy board game Risk, where you have armies in various countries and are trying to take over the world. However, this game has some notable differences to the game it's based off of. For starters, combat is heavily balanced towards defense in this game. The amount of offensive power you need to survive attacking just a single army can sometimes be ludicrous. You also have the ability to attack a country with just a single army, using just a single army. However, if you attempt this and fail, since the countries can't ever be completely empty, your army is simply taken over by the opponent you are attacking, giving them a free army and country in the process, thus making it even more imperative to attack with overwhelming power. There's also random events which can happen, usually cutting forces down in small clusters of countries, though occasionally boosting armies instead. Now, the controls in this game are somewhat clunky since you have to click on the numbers showing on each country as opposed to the countries themselves, which I guess kinda makes sense, but you'd think the game would be tracking a pixel mask in the background so that you didn't have to do that. You also keep a stock of cards, and I've noticed that the AI is far more likely to get wild cards than the player is for some reason. Plus, you only get a card at the end of your turn if you successfully take over a country during your turn. Once you have three of the same card, at the start of your next turn, you'll be prompted to cash them in, or skip doing so if you want to wait for some curious reason. The starting placements are also extremely random, to the point where a player could start with a dominating position or one that's so weak it's impossible to recover from it. Heck, I've seen the randomizer give AI players entire continents. Basically, it plays a lot like Risk, but with its own quirks and control oddities. It's definitely not a bad game, just nothing special and very frustrating until you get used to its differences from the game that it's based off of. Now we're starting to get a little more original. Squarex is based on a game style where you have to travel around a grid encircling large boxes. Once each large box has been encircled, the level is won. Now this style of gameplay actually has some similarities to Pac-Man, which can be noticed in almost every game which works in this manner. Naturally, the controls are extremely simple, as all you do is use the arrow keys to move. However, it's extremely important to note that while you can move in any direction you want, you can only change directions when you hit an intersection, meaning you absolutely must anticipate any directions you want to go by pressing the appropriate key ahead of time. If you press it even a fraction too late, you're waiting until the next intersection for it to take effect. Now, this game's alright, but it's very difficult. Fortunately, there's a few things you can take advantage of to help you out. At the start of every board, one of the squares to encircle will have some bonus points attached. If you encircle that square first, you get those points, otherwise the points disappear. 
You can also find power-ups which turn the enemy squares blue, allowing you to defeat them by running into them, a la Pac-Man. You also have the ability to practice any level in the game you want, which is a great feature for anyone not skilled enough to make it to the later levels sequentially so that they can see how much harder the game gets. Because quite frankly, this game gets really hard really fast. Other than that, and having to anticipate your moves to such a large degree, it plays well enough for what it is, and is a much more action-oriented game than most of the solo titles. Now we're getting into some good stuff. Crusher is a wholly original game where your goal is to... Well, actually, I'm not quite sure, as I've never been able to get far enough to know how it ends. Essentially, though, you're traveling through a bunch of rooms trying to find gems, bombs, and oxygen. When you reach 10,000 points, your first event occurs in a random room and you have to figure out which room to go to and then follow the series of events which transpire from there, going to more random rooms and finding more stuff. And each time you move a space, you use up a point of oxygen in your tank. When your tank expires, which happens pretty quickly, you load in another tank from your bottom meter. If you run out of oxygen, the game is over no matter how many extra lives you have left. You lose lives by running up to next one of the various spiked enemies that's roaming around. Now, in regards to these spiked enemies, their color is somewhat important. The color of the enemies in a particular room indicates how many spaces they move each time they get the chance, and while they typically want to move towards you, their movements have some randomness as well. You can defeat enemies by entrapping them with the pushable block scattered throughout every room. Enemies are also unable to move through power-ups or other enemies, though I should note that using enemies to entrap other enemies won't actually trigger them to die, though one of them will die if you defeat a different enemy with nothing but blocks and power-ups. And each time you defeat an enemy, an oxygen tank will appear in a random spot in the room. However, once you've unlocked your first event, it's just better to stop trying to defeat enemies and just make it through each room as fast as you can, since the enemies will respawn, but the power-ups won't. Alas, as original as this game is, it mostly comes down to luck. You can skew that luck a little by using the bombs you acquire to blast through just about anything, but that'll only get you so far. Thus, while the game is pretty fun, you can't expect to win it every time, even if you know exactly what you're doing. It actually kind of feels like a roguelike in that sense, and I don't really have any complaints about this one. Lastly for today we have Balloon Challenge, which is actually my favorite solo game, specifically because it's not only original, but it's a head-to-head -head strategy game that's very simple to play and goes by relatively quickly. There is still some random chance to it, but unlike most of the games before this one with randomized elements, the AI is stuck with the same board layout you are, thus clever planning with your moves can ultimately win the game for you regardless of how epic or lame the board ends up being. The gameplay is incredibly simple. Both players have a row of hot air balloons at the bottom. On your turn, you send one up and see how high it can get. The higher the balloon gets, the more points it's worth. And the trick is taking advantage of the things which can get in the way. Arrow clouds will cause balloons to glide sideways, gray storm clouds will stop balloons in their tracks, 10 point pickups are worth 10 points immediately, twisters will teleport your balloon to a random location, often, though not always, a good location, and airplanes kinda shred the balloons to pieces, making them worth no points at all. The planes also move every turn, so you need to take advantage of their movements to really score big compared to your opponent. One thing that's neat about this game are the movement mechanics. If a balloon is moved sideways thanks to an arrow cloud and it crosses over the bottom side of another balloon, it maintains its momentum and will continue to slide sideways. Arrow clouds also change the direction they're pointing in following a balloon moving across one. So sometimes a move may be worth a lot of points, but performing it will open up your opponent to make an even more valuable move. Plus, you also need to keep in mind which balloons your opponent has launched, since setting things up for yourself is nice, but can be ruined if your opponent catches on and decides to launch a balloon to mess things up for you, or score the way you intended to. For as simple as this game is compared to the others, it has a lot of depth and strategy and is very fun to play. Thus, if you're wanting to try a solo game out because you've never played one before, this is the one I would recommend people try first. Though the Crusher games aren't all that bad either, just a lot more random in their outcome. And, yeah, we're already at the end of today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. I had a feeling the time was just going to fly on this one. In any case, stay tuned for episode 154 of Ancient DOS Games coming out Saturday, February 7th, 
where I'll be taking a look at a strategy game that has some relation to Greek mythology. Uh, not really all that much. If you think you know which game that could be, then make sure to send your guests to ADG at Pixelships.com, and in the interim, I've got two solid weeks of programming ahead of me, and I plan to take full advantage of them.